Turning the Page. EU Radio presents Turning the Page. The changing face of the book world. New books, new technology, new promotional strategies. Everything you've always wanted to know about the book industry. This program involves the participation of students from the University of Rennes 2. Welcome to Turning the Page. This is Chris Evin. I'm here in the studio with Christine Bertaille and Spencer Hockridge, my usual accomplices. And we will be discussing stereotypes at home and abroad. This is our theme for today. And I think, um, Christine, you're starting with um, stereotypes abroad, right? Yes. So I don't know if you all remember, but I did start the season uh, reading from David Sedaris. So I thought as we're approaching the end of the season... I would choose from Sedaris again. Uh, I'm going to be reading an essay from Me Talk Pretty One Day. So this is Sedaris's collection published in 2000 in which he chronicles what it's like to live in France as an American, as experienced when he and his partner Hugh uh, moved to Paris for several years. So Sedaris is very observant of the various assumptions and stereotypes that come along with national identity, which is what we'll be talking about today. And very hard to choose uh, from these essays, but I think this idea of stereotypes is best exemplified in his essay, Pika Pakatoni, in which he is with an American couple, uh, he riding the metro in Paris, and this couple mistakes Sedaris for a French pickpocket. And so they start saying some very rude things about him because they assume he can't speak English. And, of course, this makes Sedaris hate them, although he, throughout the course of his, of his thought process, he also recognizes that part of his anger has to do with his own pretentiousness. And so, of course, this realization makes him hate them even more, which is typical of Sedaris's humor. So here's the extract. It was July and Hugh and I were taking the Paris metro from our neighborhood to a store, located on the other side of town. During the summer months, a great number of American vacationers can be found riding the metro, and their voices tend to carry. It's something I hadn't noticed until leaving home, but we are a loud people. The trumpeting elephants of the human race. Questions, observations, the locations of blisters and rashes, everything is delivered as though it were an announcement. Hugh and I boarded our train, where an American couple in their late 40s stood hugging the floor-to-ceiling support pole. There's no sign saying so, but such poles are not considered private. They're put there for everyone's use. You don't treat it like a fireman's pole. Rather, you grasp it with one hand and stand back at a respectable distance. It's not all that difficult to figure out, even if you come from a town without any public transportation. The train left the station, and needing something to hold on to, I wedged my hand between the American couple and grabbed the pole at waist level. The man turned to the woman, saying, P.U., can you smell that? That is pure French, baby. He removed one of his hands from the pole and waved it back and forth in front of his face. Yes, indeed, he said. This little froggy is ripe. It took me a moment to realize he was talking about me. The woman wrinkled her nose. Golly, Pete, she said. Do they all smell this bad? It's pretty typical, the man said. I'm willing to bet that our little friend here hasn't had a bath in a good two weeks. I mean, Jesus Christ, somebody should hang a deodorizer around this guy's neck. The woman laughed, saying, you crack me up, Martin. I swear you do. It's a common mistake for vacationing Americans to assume that everyone around them is French and therefore speaks no English whatsoever. These two didn't seem like exceptionally mean people. Back home, they probably would have had the decency to whisper. But here, they felt free to say whatever they wanted, face to face and in a normal tone of voice. It was the same way someone might talk in front of a building or a painting they found particularly unpleasant. An experienced traveler could have told by looking at my shoes that I wasn't French. And even if I were French... It's not as if English is some mysterious tribal dialect spoken only by anthropologists and a small population of cannibals. They happen to teach English in schools all over the world. There are no eligibility requirements. Anyone can learn it. Even people who reportedly smell bad, despite the fact that they've just taken a bath and are wearing clean clothes. Because they had used the tiresome word froggy and complained about my odor, I was now licensed to hate this couple as much as I wanted. 
This made me happy, as I'd wanted to hate them from the moment I entered the subway car and seen them hugging the pole. Unleashed by their insults, I was now free to criticize Martin's clothing. The pleated denim shorts, the baseball cap, the t-shirt advertising a San Diego pizza restaurant, sunglasses hung from his neck on a fluorescent cable, and the couple's bright new his and her sneakers suggested they might be headed somewhere dressy for dinner. Comfort has its place, but it seems rude to visit another country dressed as if you've come to mow its lawns. The man named Martin was in the process of showing the woman what he referred to as my Paris. He looked at the subway map and announced that at some point during their stay, he'd maybe take her to the Louvre, which he pronounced as having two distinct syllables, Louvre. I'm hardly qualified to belittle anyone's else, anyone else's pronunciation, but he was setting himself up by acting like such an expert. Yeah, he said, letting out a breath. I thought we might head over there someday this week and do some nosing around. It's not for everyone, but something tells me you might like it. People are often frightened of Parisians, but an American in Paris will find no harsher critic than another American. France isn't even my country, but there I was, deciding that these people needed to be sent back home, preferably in chains. In disliking them, I was forced to recognize my own pretension, and that made me hate them even more. The train took a curve, and when I moved my hand farther up the pole, the man turned to the woman, saying, Carol, hey, Carol, watch out. That guy's going after your wallet. What? Your wallet, Martin said. That joker's trying to steal your wallet. Move your pocketbook to the front where he can't get at it. She froze. And he repeated himself, barking. The front! Move your pocketbook around to the front! Do it now! The guy's a pickpocket! The woman named Carol grabbed for the strap on her shoulder and moved her pocketbook so that now it rested on her stomach. Wow, she said. I sure didn't see that coming. Well, you've never been to Paris before, but let that be a lesson to you. Martin glared at me, his eyes narrowed to slits. This city is full of stink pots, like our little friend here. Let your guard down, and they'll take you for everything you've got. Now I was a stink pot and a thief. It occurred to me to say something, but I thought it might be better to wait and see what he came up with next. Another few minutes, and he might have decided I was a crack dealer or a white slaver. Besides, if I said something at this point, he probably would have apologized, and I wasn't interested in that. His embarrassment would have pleased me. But once he recovered, there would be that awkward period that sometimes culminates in a handshake. I didn't want to touch these people's hands or see things from their point of view. I just wanted to continue hating them. So I kept my mouth shut and stared off into space. The train stopped at the next station. Passengers got off, and Carolyn Martin moved to occupy the two folding seats located beside the door. I thought they might ease on to another topic, but Martin was on a roll now, and there was no stopping him. It was some shithead like him that stole my wallet on my last trip to Paris, he said, nodding his head in my direction. He got me on the subway, came up from behind, and I never felt a thing. Cash, credit cards, driver's license, poof, all of it gone, just like that. I pictured a scoreboard reading, Marty Zero, Stinkpots One, and clenched my fist in support of the home team. What you've got to understand is that these creeps are practiced professionals, he said. I mean, they've got it down to an art, if you can call that an art form. I wouldn't call it an art form, Carol said. Art is beautiful, but taking people's wallets, that stinks in my opinion. You've got that right, Martin said. The thing, that these joker, the thing is that these jokers usually work in pairs. He squinted toward the opposite end of the train. Odds are, he's probably got a partner somewhere on the subway car. You think so? I know so, he said. They usually time it so that one of them clips your wallet just as a train pulls into the station. The other guy's job is to run interference and trip you up once you catch wind of what's going on. Then the train stops, the doors open, and they disappear into the crowd. If Stinky there had gotten his way, he'd probably be halfway to Timbuktu by now. I mean, make no mistake, these guys are fast. I'm not the sort of person normally mistaken for being fast and well-coordinated, And because of this, I found Martin's assumption to be oddly flattering. Stealing wallets was nothing to be proud of, but I like being thought of as cunning and professional. I'd been up until 4 a.m. the night before reading a book about recluse spiders. But to him, the circles beneath my eyes likely reflected a long evening spent snatching flies out of the air, or whatever it is that pickpockets do for practice. The meatball, he said. Look at him, just standing there waiting for his next victim. If I had my way, he'd be picking pockets with his teeth. An eye for an eye, that's what I say.
Somebody got to chop the guy's hands off and feed them to the dogs. Ooh, I thought, but first you'll have to catch me. It just gets my goat, he says. I mean, where is a policione when you need one? Policione? Where did he think he was? I tried to imagine Martin's conversation with a French policeman and pictured him waving his arms, shouting, That man tried to pick up my friend as Pacatoni. I wanted very much to hear such a conversation and decided I would take the wallet from Hugh's back pocket as we left the train. Martin would watch me steal from a supposed stranger and most likely would intercede. He'd put me in a headlock or yell for help. And when a crowd gathered, I'd say, what's the problem? Is it against the law to borrow money from my boyfriend? If the police came, Hugh would explain the situation in his perfect French, while I'd toss in a few of my most polished phrases. That guy's crazy, I say, pointing to Martin. I think he's drunk. Look at how his face is swollen. I was practicing these lines to myself when Hugh came up from behind and tapped me on the shoulder, signaling that the next stop was ours. There you go, Martin said. That's him. That's the partner. Didn't I tell you he was around here somewhere? They always work in pairs. It's the oldest trick in the book. Hugh had been reading the paper and had no idea what had been going on. It was too late now to pretend to pick his pocket, and I was stuck without a decent backup plan. As we pulled into the station, I recalled an afternoon ten years earlier. I'd been riding the Chicago L with my sister Amy, who was getting off three or four stops ahead of me. The doors opened, and as she stepped out of the crowded car, she turned around to yell, So long, David! Good luck beating that rape charge! Everyone on board had turned to stare at me. Some seemed curious, some seemed frightened, but the overwhelmingly majority appeared to hate me with a passion I had never before encountered. That's my sister, I'd said. She likes to joke around. I laughed and smiled, but it did no good. Every gesture made me appear more guilty, and I wound up getting off at the next stop rather than continue riding alongside people who thought of me as a rapist. I wanted to say something that good to Martin, but I can't think as fast as Amy. In the end, this man would go home warning his friends to watch out for pickpockets in Paris. He'd be the same old Martin, but at least for the next few seconds, I still had the opportunity to be somebody different, somebody quick and dangerous. The dangerous me noticed how Martin tightened his fist when the train pulled to a stop. Carol held her pocketbook close against her chest and sucked in her breath as Hugh and I stepped out of the car. No longer finicky little boyfriends on their overseas experiment, but rugs, accomplices, halfway to Timbuktu. Yeah, that, well, that was great, wasn't it? That's was hilarious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't help laughing at, uh, at, at, at certain parts of that. Yeah, 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 no, marvellous. Yeah. I think my favourite line is probably um, when he talks about people being frightened of Parisians, but that, in fact, it's the Americans in Paris who are who are the harshest judges of of other Americans. It's almost, and I think you see that with foreign communities. You know, they become very territorial after living in a an area for a specific amount of time, they are the experts, it's, it's theirs. And yeah. when people from back home come, yeah. you're, and I know this from experience, yeah, you are more critical mm. of, of these people. Yeah, no, no, I think that is fascinating that, that uh, I think when you live abroad, there's a certain point where, where you're, you're not socialized and you're resistant and you're critical of the culture that you've come exactly. to. Exactly, you lose your but, tolerance. But, but then yeah. after a certain time, you become socialized and people coming from your country who perhaps are critical of the culture that they're coming to, yeah, that you are judge, very judgmental of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which, as he says, is a sort of pretension as well, which I, I, I exactly. think as well you... you become very self-conscious that you're criticising characteristics which, which you are your from, own, yeah, 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 or, or yeah. which certainly you recognise as your own. And yeah. I think part of it stems from embarrassment too when you see uh, and recognise the stereotypes from home and you imagine how they're perceived by you know, this adopted environment in which you live and I think it becomes, yeah, you become very resentful of these people because they're representing who you are and... Um, and I think that's why you become very critical. This idea of Americans on the metro, I mean, it just rings so true. Yeah. And um, I think many of us who are Americans living in France have, have been there. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. cruel but funny. And, and I imagine that the communities are somewhat smaller um, when you um, uh, come to a foreign country. Um, uh, the communities coming from a, a, a different country tend to know each other quite quickly yeah. and um, maybe the criticism is slightly enhanced by the fact that everybody knows everybody type of thing. Yeah. And um, 
yes, there are the, the newcomers who are probably on the grill, <laughs> yeah. slightly more so, and, and the ones who have been around for slightly longer uh, sort of know better. They probably also know that this microcosm can be judgmental. Mm. They, they, they have worked out what this <clears throat> microcosm is about and um, are sl- maybe slightly um, on their guard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when I lived in Portugal for for, for two years, um, there, there was a, a British club in in Portugal, and and um, there was a cricket, a beautiful mm. cricket green at the British club in the middle of Portugal, which isn't isn't <laughs> noted for its wonderful cricket greens, is it? Um, <laughs> uh, and and yeah, that that for me just epitomised um, something. Um, which I didn't perhaps too much like about about Britishness and Britishness abroad, which was a sort of colonial um, element uh, that, that these people were implanting themselves and imposing their their, their own culture, which uh, is obviously different to what you're describing there with, with, with uh, David Sedaris's piece. But but it, yes, again, still fascinating that the way um, uh, uh, foreign nationals when they gather abroad, yeah, yeah, yeah um, can, can uh, uh, adopt a particular posture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that and, um, reminds me of like, for example, in the extract that I just read, how the two Americans on the the metro assume that no one else is speaking English, yeah. and so that they are pretty much, you know, in a crowded metro alone and able to, you know, say really horrible things about the person standing yeah. right next to them. And it's funny because these same Americans will go into a, a cafe or a shop and inspect the employees <laughs> to speak English, and so it's it's sort yeah. of this double standard yeah. in terms of language. But yeah, I do think that sometimes they think they're in some sort of uh, cocoon, or where, where yeah. you know they they can they can carry their culture, their language with them, and they don't necessarily need to melt into into yeah. the environment. Yeah, yeah, I think it can go both ways. You, you either become an expert on the culture you've adopted and you don't like other people <laughs> who are who are, are less cultured or more uncouth, as you see it, in terms of their understanding of this culture that you now comprehend, or, or, or they become a bubble uh, and they try to impose or just live mm-hmm. their culture implanted in another country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I think the British perhaps do do have a tendency or did have a tendency, I don't know whether it's still so much the case, to to, to implant themselves right. in that way and, and yeah. maintain that, that Britishness um, in a foreign country. And I think that really comes from the, the history of the British colonies yeah, as well. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And since you speak of the British, we'll, we'll have a break now and then after the break we'll talk about stereotypes at home and I yeah. think you've got a reading for us Absolutely. concerning the British. Yeah, yeah very much so. <laughs> So stay with us, and we'll be back after the musical break. Say a 
turning the page. Welcome back to Turning the Page. This week's program is Stereotypes at Home and Abroad. We're now going to focus on England with a book which you might want to introduce, um, Spencer. Yeah, yeah, this is a book mm. by Julian Barnes and it's mm-hmm. called England, England. And uh, so certainly for me, I think it's a, an hilarious satire on, on what it is to be English and uh, uh, English history. Um, I'll just read the little intro on the back, actually, because it sums it up very, very concisely what this book is about. Um, As every schoolboy knows, you can fit the whole of England on the Isle of Wight. Grotesque, visionary tycoon Sir Jack Pittman takes the saying literally and does exactly that. He constructs on the island the project, a vast heritage centre containing everything English, from Big Ben to Stonehenge, from Manchester United to the White Cliffs of Dover. The project is monstrous, risky and vastly successful. In fact, it gradually begins to rival old England and even threatens to supersede it. One of Barnes's finest and funniest novels, England, England, calls into question the idea of replicas, truth against fiction, reality against art, nationhood, myth-making and self-exploration. So, yeah, this is a wonderful book um, looking at what it is to be English, um, English people's perception of of themselves, of of their history. Um, And I suppose, yeah, the stories that we believe, the stories we live by um, uh, and the history, the myths that we believe in. And, and, yeah, obviously some of it is myth um, uh, uh, when we look at our history. But I, I think there are many communal aspects that, yeah, many English people, People, many British people would recognise in this book as as being things that we very we we attach ourselves to, and we and we think are are very much the essence of who we are. Um, and and uh, yeah, Barnes captures this wonderfully, particularly in this grotesque character, this tycoon, um, who's very full of himself. And and, and it, it, this tycoon is is concerned about his legacy, um, and he wants this project that that is going to exemplify all. things things English and he wants to be remembered for this marvellous project. Um, So he organises a a survey to find out what people um, think of as as the quintessences, the quintessences of of England and Englishness. Um, And this is a list. I won't read the whole list. There's a list of 50 items that that, that, uh, characterise what it is to be English. Um, but but I'll read the first few. So number one, the royal family. Number two, <laughs> um, Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. Number three, Manchester United Football Club. Number four, the class system. Number five, pubs. Number six, a robin in the snow. Number seven, Robin Hood and his merry men. Number eight, cricket. Number nine, the White Cliffs of Dover. Number ten, imperialism. Number eleven, Union Jack. Number 12, snobbery. Number 13, (laughs) God Save the Queen. Uh, Number 14, BBC. Number 15, West End. 16, Times Newspaper. 17, Shakespeare. 18, Thatched Cottages. 19, Cup of Tea. Devonshire (laughs) Cream Tea. 20, Stonehenge. Um, 21, Phlegm. Stiff Upper Lip. 22, Shopping. 23, Marmalade. And so it goes on to number 50, which is the Magna Carta. Um, So, yeah, they have a meeting about this because this is what people have said. Uh, This is what they think of as Englishness. Um, And so Jack has this meeting. He says, well, you you know, if this is what people think is Englishness, then we need to give them this on the Isle of Wight. So we need to construct all of these things on the Isle of Wight. And rather than people having to meander all the way around England, which takes a long time on a coach, you can come just to the Isle of Wight and see everything everything uh, very quickly <laughs> all in one place um, and it, I mean it becomes completely <laughs> ludicrous because he actually employs the royal family to, to, to come to the Isle of Wight so the the, oil, the the royal family are actually taken from Buckingham Palace in London and are, are transposed <laughs> onto the Isle of Wight where they have to do official appearances um, and are paid for their role as, as the royal family <laughs> on the Isle of Wight so um, yeah I mean it is, it's uh, 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 hilarious hilarious but um, this is what I'll just read this a little bit because after they've heard this list 
um, uh, they then discuss, yeah, yeah, yeah what what, what, what um, uh, th- they should uh, focus on in terms of um, uh, uh, the elements that should be represented on the Isle of Wight. So, yeah, once they've read through the list, this is what, what takes place next. Jeff watched Sir Jack's expression move between wealth, a uh, wise self-congratulation and acrid dismay as he worked through the list. Then a fleshy hand dismissed him, and Jeff knew the bitterness of the messenger. Alone, Sir Jack considered the printout again. It frankly deteriorated towards the end. He crossed off items he judged the result of faulty polling technique and pondered the rest. Many had been correctly foreseen. There would be no shortage of shopping and thatched cottages serving Devonshire cream teas on the island. Gardening, breakfast, taxis, double-deckers, those were all useful endorsements. A robin in the snow. Where had that come from? All those Christmas cards, perhaps? The Magna Carta was currently being translated into decent English. The Times newspaper was no doubt easily acquired. Beef eaters would be fattened up, and the White Cliffs of Dover relocated without much linguistic wrenching to what had previously been White Cliff Bay. Big Ben, the Battle of Britain, Robin Hood, Stonehenge couldn't be simpler. But there were problems at the top of the list, numbers one, two and three to be precise. Sir Jack had put out early feelers to Parliament, but his initial offer to the nation's legislators put at a working breakfast with the Speaker of the House of Commons had been insensitively received. The word contempt might even have been used. The football club would be easier. He'd send Mark up to Manchester with a team of top negotiators. Little blue-eyed Mark, who looked like a soft touch, and then flattered uh, and then flattered you into signing your life away. No doubt there would be matters of local pride, civic tradition and so on. There always were. Sir so Jack knew that in each case it was rarely just a question of price. It was price combined with the necessary self-deception that price was finally less important than principle. What principle might apply here? Well, Mark would find one, and if they dug their little studs in, you could always buy up the club's title behind its back, or simply copy and tell them to fuck off. Um, right, well, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm running out of time. But yeah, basically, he, he's seeking to, to all of these elements of English this, to, to put them on the island. Um, and yeah, hilariously, people come to the island in the end to see England and neglect the real England, yeah, which becomes a sort of backwater. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, it's a wonderful comic insight in, into what it is to be English, yeah, and how we perceive ourselves. Um, yeah, but it's uh, a shame. We don't have time yeah. for the full list of 50 stereotypes, according to Julian Barnes. <laughs> but if you want to, if our listeners, if you want to find out about those 50 stereotypes, I encourage you to read England, England by Julian Barnes. And thank you, Spencer, having for having brought that in. It's time for um, your radio's next program. So we will come to a close and we hope you will be with us next month on Turning the Page. Thanks for listening. Join us again next month for Turning the Page. Podcasts of this program are available on euradio.fr. We would like to thank the UFR des Langues and the students from the Master de Didactique des Langues.